philosophy as the relentless pursuit of truth and rigorous critical thinking appears profoundly incompatible with its presentation on social media platforms. The idea of teaching philosophy, much less doing philosophy, through this medium seemingly degrades the depth the nuance of philosophical exploration, transforming it into mere spectacle. This skepticism isn't solely a product of old school philosophers prioritizing the essence of things over their appearances. Recent thinkers like Derrida and Baudrillard, known for challenging conventional philosophical narratives, express deep reservations about examples of philosophical ideas in video format. Derrida visibly cringed when asked about the philosophical dimensions of the sitcom Seinfeld, while Baudrillard criticized the Matrix movies for their interpretation of his ideas. Given their response to the media of that period, one can only wonder what level of dismissiveness they would have expressed toward the suggestion of philosophical ideas being presented on platforms like YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok. As a personal encounter with this attitude, one distinguished philosopher explicitly advised me to abandon my YouTube endeavors and instead place my efforts in the more serious practices of reading and writing. Are these philosophers right in their downright dismissal of online platforms? Are we doomed to a superficial presentation of philosophy that really lacks any merit? And beyond presenting other philosophers' ideas, is it even remotely possible to actually philosophize? That is, to do the creative work that marks the heart of genuine philosophical investigation. In many ways, I profoundly resonate with these reactions and can't merely relegate them to the views of an old guard. There is good reason to be suspicious of philosophy on social media platforms. However, my affirmation of these philosophers' concerns has some notable caveats. It's crucial to recognize that philosophy on YouTube isn't monolithic. It spans a spectrum, from conventional lectures to content that merges entertainment with a semblance of philosophical discussion. Such diversity merits examination before dismissing social media's contribution to promoting and producing philosophical ideas. And I aim to explore and clarify this nuanced intersection in this video essay. This discussion should be contextualized within the present state of philosophy itself, as there is good reason to believe this field has been waning. Over the past several decades, there has been a general trend of declining enrollment in humanities programs, especially philosophy here in the U.S. Several factors are at play in this change. There's increasing emphasis on job-ready skills in higher education. As college costs have risen, many focus on degrees that lead to job opportunities such as those in STEM fields. Public discourse increasingly frames humanities and liberal art degrees as less valuable than these more vocationally oriented degrees. This development could be interpreted as the decadence of a culture that has lost all sense of philosophy's supposed role in steering us toward a reasoned public discourse on matters of social importance. One very well may point to the degradation of political debates in contemporary society and the rhetoric of online discourse that in conjunction with a technological capitalist utilitarian sensibility, has driven philosophy out as a useless relic of a bygone age. However, it's important to situate this recent change within the broader history of philosophical activity, which reveals how this characterization of the role of philosophy from which we are supposedly declining communicates a misguided nostalgia. Philosophy is rarely held such prestige in society at large. Philosophers, like artists, previously depended upon independent wealth or patrons to support them in their activities. Schools and institutions of higher learning that date back to Plato's Academy and monastic institutions played a significant role in preserving and transmitting philosophical knowledge. However, it wasn't until the 19th century that philosophy began distinguishing itself from other disciplines. 
At that time, we saw the establishment of the first formal philosophical journals and professional associations. Philosophy became a distinct profession within academia, with dedicated departments, faculty positions, and degree programs. As philosophy professionalized, it also faced criticisms about its accessibility, relevance, and insularity. Consequently, it could be argued that any fall of our present philosophical edifice is the demise of a recent exception in philosophy rather than the decimation of some protracted tradition, and that perhaps the decline of institutionalized philosophy is in fact a deterioration of something that already marked a decline. As such, rather than a state of decadence, we might be finding ourselves within a productive crisis that makes possible a transformation in how philosophical thought is disseminated and even produced. And herein, social media platforms offer a possible reprieve for philosophy. While the digital evolution of philosophical discourse is exciting, it's important to acknowledge its apparent limitations. Many platforms, such as YouTube, feature content that, while labeled as philosophical, often lacks the depth, rigor, and commitment traditionally associated with the field. More concerning is the potential blurring of lines between genuine philosophy and a watered-down self-help iteration presented for mass consumption, prioritizing entertainment and profit over intellectual integrity. Becoming a philosopher necessitates a rigorous education and an unwavering self-critical quest for truth. It cannot be a passing fancy to be pursued sporadically. Occasional engagements don't define a true philosopher. Rather, it invites and requires an intense commitment that transcends mere casual acquaintance. This is because reading and doing philosophy is very hard work. Just as one would only embark on the formidable ascent of Mount Everest with extensive preparation, one should approach profound philosophical texts with similar dedication and readiness. The suggestion that philosophical insights could and should always be distilled to easily digestible forms for universal consumption is one I deeply challenge. While I acknowledge the value of presenting philosophical ideas in simplified formats to serve as gateways for the uninitiated, it's crucial to distinguish this pedagogical consideration from the intricacies and demands of deep philosophical exploration and engagement with primary texts. For all their problems and limitations, traditional academic structures upheld strict standards and shaped the study and practice of philosophy. One of the hallmarks of this traditional method is its emphasis on producing an extensive secondary literature. Though this might sometimes be viewed as an overindulgence in the works of predecessors, it underscores the invaluable skill of scholarly engagement. After all, the most influential philosophers are often also profound historians of philosophical thought. Creative interpretations of philosophical works requires a foundational understanding of canonical readings. A key question that any online creator dedicated to the craft of philosophy is this. Can the social media platform serve a similar function for any viewers committed enough to seek out such an education outside structures of institutional support? And can it do it in spite of itself? That is, despite its lure to appease the big other that governs it, the algorithm that rewards content that successfully monopolizes the attention economy of its viewers. In observing our contemporary landscape of philosophical discourse online, I'm reminded of the nascent days of philosophy in ancient Greece, before the establishment of structured philosophical schools. Public spaces were abuzz with citizens engrossed in rich conversations and spirited debates. And much like today's digital platforms where varied voices seek to captivate audiences, ancient Greece had its sophists. These sophists were known for their enticing yet often superficial rhetorical skills, favoring flashiness over the substance and rigor that deeper philosophical inquiries demand. This parallel between past and present serves as a reminder. Every age has its spectrum of discourse, ranging from the profound to the superficial, challenging us to discern genuine wisdom amidst the noise. And we should expect no different from the emergence of this new social media platform. In light of this situation, 
philosophical content creators are seemingly presented with a decision. On one hand, they can delve deep into philosophical intricacies, risking alienation from a wider audience. On the other, they might choose to skim the surface, prioritizing broad appeal over depth. Of course, the landscape isn't entirely binary like I'm presenting it here. Some content creators successfully merge the visual allure of digital media with substantive philosophical content, defying the depth versus surface dichotomy I've painted here. An exemplary channel in this regard is Then and Now, initiated in 2016. This channel consistently strikes a delicate balance by presenting profound philosophical ideas with both visual appeal and a good deal of academic rigor. Achieving this equilibrium is a challenging feat, no doubt. It demands proficiency in video production and editing, a comprehensive grasp of the philosophical literature, and the ability to distill complex ideas without diluting their essence. At its core, novel thoughts are produced out of the vast, overwhelming flow of life intersecting with a set of material conditions that shape and direct that flow. Consider an electrical wire. It harnesses and channels the raw power of a current, directing it. Similarly, a prism takes in the unobservable nuances of white light and, upon interaction, reveals a diverse spectrum of vibrant colors. Both examples elucidate a fundamental idea. The raw, boundless givenness of life is transformed, guided, and even revealed by the medium it encounters. The fecundity and richness of thought is invariably influenced by the materials or mediums that guide, shape, and sometimes challenge it. And today we stand on the precipice of a new era, presented with novel mediums and tools that will refract and shape the excessive givenness of life in ways that give rise to a thinking we have yet to fully comprehend or anticipate. Engaging in philosophy within the sprawling realm of social media is to embark on a journey into uncharted intellectual territories, where emergent concepts reshape the fabric of our thought. The trajectory of this evolution remains elusive, but the transformative shifts are unfurling around us, unnoticed in their nascent stages. Much like a subtle perfume that permeates the air before it is recognized, these evolving paradigms will subtly envelop our intellectual atmosphere. Only then will future philosophers, with their astute perceptions, distill and articulate the subtle sense of change that are now teasingly wafing around us, hinting at a profound metamorphosis in philosophical thought. I don't know what that future of philosophy will be. I can only identify what needs to be in place for that future to be a thriving one thriving in the sense of furthering the field of philosophy, and not in terms of viewership. For the future of a rigorous philosophy to have any chance on these platforms, I think there are at least five pillars that I would uphold for that philosophy. First and foremost, we must embrace intellectual humility, or to put it provocatively and in Lacanian terms, we must become castrated viewers and creators. Recognizing an inherent insufficiency or lack is pivotal. By accepting this limitation, one is better positioned to approach philosophical ideas in a way that fosters the emergence of truly innovative insights. This notion of assuming castration as a viewer and creator is my own rendition of the Socratic notion that true wisdom proceeds from recognizing one's own ignorance. Of course, humility without a knowledge of what one is ignorant about is as dangerous for philosophy as is a knowledge without humility. The path to a cultivated humility, a truly intellectual humility, is reading, our second pillar. There is simply no substitute for engaging with the texts themselves. When I was in my clinical psych program, we learned a lot about diagnosis and interventions in the classroom. But... I found very little of it truly resonated until I began encountering clients in the therapy room. It's very difficult to start up therapy without some background knowledge, but it's very hard to truly grasp that knowledge until you start applying it. Primary texts here are like that client, and those graduate courses are like these videos. 
The more you read the text alongside viewing videos like these, the more each will mutually benefit the other. A third pillar is implied here, that being teaching. In this context, I'm referring to presenting philosophical ideas through these social media platforms. There needs to be videos presented at various levels, just like you have with language learning channels. Some videos and channels are designed for introducing ideas, while others are meant for the more initiated learners. There needs to be this diversity of presentation styles, modalities, and levels of depth to meet the needs of all kinds of viewers. And for this reason, I generally look favorably upon even those channels that might fall under the umbrella of oversimplifying ideas for the sake of broad appeal. My criticism is not with those presentations in themselves, but only to the degree that they leave viewers with a sense that they have truly understood the philosophical ideas being represented. That is, to the degree these kinds of engaging videos serve as a means to disavow our intellectual castration. For our third pillar to more fully actualize itself, to have philosophy channels that truly address the needs of not only the beginner but also the more advanced, there is a need to support these creators. Our fourth pillar. As already mentioned, we are in a situation not unlike previous epics in which the philosophers of online media depend on patrons to support their creative endeavors. For this reason, I encourage anyone with the means to do so to consider supporting at least one of your favorite philosophy content creators. It can be any of the highly worthy ones that are out there. The point is that the collective force of crowdfunding will enable creators to dedicate more time and energy to the quality and quantity of content produced. And this will have a benefit for everyone. Finally, the fifth pillar is community. If each creator and their respective viewers are off on their own little intellectual bubbles, it will be difficult for our ideas to be truly tested and sharpened by the resistances put up by conversation partners. It's also the case that the more these kinds of online communities form and engage in conversations and interviews and other kinds of interactive engagements, the more excitement and motivation there will be for doing this kind of work. Philosophy is a very isolating endeavor. But even the most recluse philosopher desires to share their ideas, if not for the sake of forming relationships, then at least to have their ideas tested by the fires of intellectual engagement. And you need an other to do that. In that vein, I've observed burgeoning trends of online schools, as I'm calling them, such as the group called the Young Zuzekians, consisting of several content creators. These are predominantly channels centered around rich conversations, interviews, and dialogues. They act as virtual symposia, fostering collaboration among YouTubers, bloggers, Instagram influencers, and other digital personalities who share a philosophical or theoretical sensibility. This evolution resonates deeply with me because it echoes a cherished aspect of traditional academia, a cohesive, vibrant community of scholars. Until recently, such a sense of scholarly camaraderie was a facet of academia that seemed conspicuously absent on social media platforms. This recent emergence of communities also harkens back once again to ancient Greece. In that era, philosophical practice wasn't ensconced solely within ivy-clad academic walls. Instead, philosophers would venture into public spaces like the Athenian Agora to engage, discuss, and debate ideas. Given the current societal backdrop where genuine connections and community often feel elusive, the rise of these virtual congregations of individuals with shared sensibilities is a heartening development. And in my perspective, they represent more than just spaces for discussion. They are emblematic of a rekindling of community spirit in an increasingly isolated digital world. So this is a video quite different than anything else I've done on this channel. I think that doing philosophy has often entailed inquiring into what it means to do philosophy. And likewise, in attempting to discuss philosophy through the vehicle of social media, I believe it's important in the creative work that lies ahead of us for us to philosophize about this very activity we're doing. And in doing so, perhaps come to some new insight concerning philosophy itself.
For if philosophy is not independent from the medium that expresses it, then inevitably how we philosophize must reflexively consider what it means to do so in the age of social media. So thank you for watching as always, and until next time, be well.